What's the best way for you as a composer to work with a filmmaker to elevate their story? Let's talk about it. Welcome, this is Sonic Storytellers episode 13. Very excited today because we have a special guest, Nicholas Kirk, Nick Kirk, yes. whichever Kirk? you prefer. Oh we're goodness. up here, Sweet. Okay. we're doing this. Uh, and today we're gonna be chatting about how to elevate your film stories with music. Now, I couldn't think of a better person to ask to talk about this subject than Nick because he is both a filmmaker and a composer, which is a very rare breed. In fact, you were the very first one I've ever met. Uh, <laughs> who would claim to be both a professional filmmaker and composer and I think that's a really cool perspective to talk from because usually when you talk to with filmmakers they're not very fluent in the music language yep. you talk to composers they don't know how to talk about film and we've talked previously a lot about uh, people who go to film school they'll try to learn how to actually uh, make films because you know if you don't know how to make a film then you probably aren't gonna write music that's actually effective sure. for a film so I'm really excited to jump in here and to chat about a few different things such as how you got your first film scoring job some of the basics some of some of your history about how white still motion pictures came about uh, some strategies for how to work with a composer or as a filmmaker to work with a composer or a composer to work with a filmmaker and vice versa maybe some new advice uh, or advice for some new film composers and some things along those lines. But a, a really quick background about Nick. Uh, we actually grew up on the same street. We did. Uh, which is very funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here we are years, years later, and we both end up becoming composers. Um, we kind of crossed paths a little bit throughout uh, the last few years, but recently we both actually serve at the same church, uh, playing on the same worship team. Yep. Uh, he's an electric guitarist, I'm a keyboardist, and so we just recently crossed paths again, and I think it's a really cool thing that we can uh, talk about this, and I know it's going to be super valuable for everyone who listens or watches this, because uh, I think there's a ton of great content and a lot of uh, value that Nick has to share on this subject that I think it kind of takes this unique perspective of filmmaker plus composer to really dive into some of these subjects. So let's do it, let's jump in. We are on the clock. So let's just talk about you for a second, Nick. Oh, and by the way, I can't I can't uh, start without letting you know if you <laughs> if you want to know more about Nick, uh, jump on whitestonemp.com. That stands for Whitestone Motion Pictures, uh, which is a motion picture company he co-founded. And also you can follow him on Instagram at Nicholas Kirk do it. It's good stuff. Love it. It's guessing good stuff. All right, so let's yeah. jump in. Uh, so Nick, how did you land your very first film scoring job? I'm super curious. I know everyone listening is too. Uh, I had a, I mean, I fell backwards into this. I've always, I was a movie fan before I did anything with music. Just, you know, I grew up with Indiana Jones and Back to the Future. I was dressed up like that in the woods playing stuff. Um, my first gig came out of college. I was in a band, and uh, the person that I worked with at Weissman, Brandon McCormick, had, I don't even remember how, I think he had, I think, no, that's what it was. Yeah, I was in college with a guy named Matt Utterback who plays bass for a, a country artist named Hunter Hayes, and Matt was a dual major, uh, you know, penchant for punishment. He was film scoring <laughs> and bass performance, and I was a music business major, and I would hang out with him and go over stuff, and when he came back home, over the summer, he met Brandon, and I guess he had done a couple films with him. And then over the years, Matt moved on to playing, realizing that bass was kind of his calling mm. in the film scoring, which I'm sure he's paying off the student loans for film scoring now. I bet he loves that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, yeah. Also went to Dequila right down the road. Matt's, oh, nice. That's excellent. Ridiculous bass player. He's one of the best bass players in Nashville. He's insane. But he, um, I, that's how I introduced to Brandon. And then Brandon just had liked the band I was in and had wondered if I knew how to, you know, put music over stuff which I had no idea how to do I mm. actually started in sound even wonder if I could do sound and I knew how to use Pro Tools I was producing my own band and starting to produce other bands I was like oh, I'm sure I could figure this out he said very uh, ignorantly and, and arrogantly <laughs> um, and that it just kind of fell into it after that I've really very much fallen into this whole this whole thing of just being a fan of film and uh, music in one big bundle, you know? So which came first? Was it a love for film or is it a love for music? I mean, if I look back, it's clearly a love for music. It was in my DNA. My dad was a golf professional though, and so like music just, it's not anything we really did. And my mom listened to, you know, uh, God bless her, but the worst music in the world. <laughs> and so I was just like, well, this doesn't, it didn't interest me, but yeah. my grandpa would go and buy me, like I remember my earliest memory is him buying me a Beach Boys tape. 
Hey, I've Beach seen... Boys is good stuff. Beach Boys is I love amazing. It. My favorite record of all time is Pet Sounds. So I'm, okay. but the but the point is like he just got me this little record. And it was like he was the only person that kind of feed in the music interest, and I had an affinity for it, but I never had really an outlet for it until you know you go to school and join bands and stuff like that, and the marching mm-hmm. band and that kind of channeled me. Oh, I can actually have a decent ability at this. You know? <laughs> Who knew when I was a kid? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how did the actual first film come? Was it through Brandon or was it some... Yeah, Brandon is the one that kind of, he just believed in me and liked... I mean, if I'm trying to bullet down to something, it's probably just a sense of melody because when you're... I was a songwriter and still feel like I'm more of a songwriter than anything else. That's kind mm-hmm. of the thing that I gravitate towards most that comes... that I've probably put the most energy towards. And and but but being in love with film scores my whole life because, I mean, who doesn't love singing, you know... Raiders or Star Wars, sure. it just is in your DNA, you know. Um, and I grew up, I grew up also going to a lot of plays and seeing a lot of musicals. Was something I did when I was a kid, not knowing that it was kind of being ingra- ingrained yeah. into my brain. Um, but that just turned about. It turned about that way through Brandon just asking me if I could do it, and I said, "Yeah, I'll try." It, you know, we'll see what happens. So, and, what and, was that first film? Oh gosh, the first film was. Or what kind of genre was it? Um, I think it was an animated thing. If I'm is either that or a video piece that I put music over or an anime? I mean, this is so long. I've done, I mean, hundreds at this point of, of you know, small pieces. Some get bigger, but I'm trying to think of the first one. I don't even remember because we just, we was working at a church too. It was like you do stuff mm-hmm. every week. That was one of the best proving grounds and for for doing this is there's a Sunday every week. So mm-hmm. you got to make something, you know, and it was like, well, we're making something this week and you think you did a good job. And then Monday is like, well, we're doing something next week too. And I was just like, well, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll help out and, <laughs> kind of fell into it that way cool so how would you say the filmmaking process began for you well the filmmaking side man is more of just when we started this we were just a a couple guys and 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 I wasn't the first person there there's other people helping and we just had to make so much stuff that you just realize that you know you've seen we've all seen films and there's a million credits and you go all Mm -hmm. these people are filmmakers and and I tell this to every musician because everyone wants to especially now with the music business the way is everyone wants to know how to get in film and do stuff and I'm and I'm they always ask the people I mean ask me and I'm like I don't know I kind of fell into it so I I give really bad advice so forgive me everyone I'm gonna he's an accidental composer yeah I'm gonna give (laughs) terrible advice here no but it but it but it did turn into like um it did turn into just something that I would do for to see if I could do it, you know what I mean? It mm-hmm. was just one of those, it was just kind of one of those things, can I do this, will this be something that is possible to do? And then it worked, I guess, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so how did that, uh, maybe making them for a hobby or as yeah. to experiment, how did that actually transition into a full-time, I'm gonna co-create Whitestone Motion Pictures, yeah, I mean, make the, this a professional career? Yeah, the film, the filmmaker side, it was just, if you, if you're going to put music in a film or really anything, you're a storyteller first and foremost. I mean, I think human beings, before even music, I think we were storytellers. Maybe we were making guttural sounds, but you're looking, you're painting images on caves, or just human beings are natural storytellers. So that filmmaking side, uh, for me, just uh, came out of a sense of storytelling. You you learn how to do this, and then you realize that my favorite scores actually usually happen to be in the best movies, and just wondering how they're telling these stories and going, okay. Is it is an accident that I rarely like scores from bad movies? It doesn't mm. happen that often, and so I find the best ones kind of can marry with each other, if that makes sense. That's interesting. So how did Whitestone enter that Whitestone picture? Was, Brian and I, again, uh, I know I'm rambling here. Brian and I just, we, he was kind of doing this already, and I, I had gotten right out of college and was going to move to either uh, New York or L.A. and decide to do whatever in the film in the music business I was going to do and when we met up all of our things that we kind of believed about how we should be influencing culture through this art were just right in line it was very weird because I've never it, for me it was like I graduated college and met someone who kind of believed exactly what I thought and we said oh we can do this together and I haven't really met very many people that have that same mentality since it kind of was very fortuitous um, that yeah. we met and and stemmed off from there and just turned and, it, and again that turned into me joining up with what he was doing and just kind of formulating what we made over the years to be this kind of vision that exists today. Wow. So what would you say to someone, I've actually done several videos on this because it's a very hot topic. What would you say to someone, uh, either a filmmaker or composer who is not in LA, not in New York, sure. they, they don't believe that they can make it where they are? Because we're over here in Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. and there still, there is a lot of growth happening in Atlanta for oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. but. 10 years ago yeah how long ago did you start 
Um, why seven? It's probably ten years. Yeah, right? it's been almost thirteen years now. Wow. I was thinking about the other day. Yeah, okay, I mean, thirteen years ago, yeah, there wasn't a lot here. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> what was the inspiration behind that? Of we can actually make a profession, making movies and making um, short films. Making yeah, there's yeah. a lot that you do. Yeah. Um, you have to love it. How do I mean? Yeah. I mean, but that, that's where it comes from, though. You have to. I mean. Music is not the the greatest career. It's the best hobby in the world. I think. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but for real, point. but it is like I tell anyone yeah. that's like, you have to love this more than anything in the world. You have to be compelled. You have to wake up in the middle of the night with a song in your head. And if you're not there, there's too many of us that do do that. I just don't, I don't think they'll ever get caught up because I walk around mm -hmm. with music blasting in my brain. I wish I could turn it off when I go to sleep. Sometimes <laughs> I can't. And I'm sure you understand that. Yeah, and if yeah. you don't have that, you're. I don't know if you're ever going to get caught up to the people that do walk around that way because, I don't know. I don't, know, I don't know how to explain that any you know does that make sense yeah. though like that it's that kind of mentality that that okay do you think that 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 passion alone if you're in Oklahoma somewhere in the middle of nowhere USA yeah or even globally you have a global audience here what would you say to someone that has zero access to those hubs what what advice do you have for them? Well, the internet's great now too. You know, you can find anyone online and anyone that wants something. And make, I mean, my advice to everyone is always make a ton of stuff, mm -hmm. experience, and just no one is ever going to be waiting for your thing. You have to present it to people. No one is. I mean, I, I we have a film we're trying to get made right now, and no one's asking for this film. You know, when you when you hit a little bit of success, people will say, "Well, what do you work on next?" And maybe if mm -hmm. you have the thing you've been working on for years that you can plop out, but but make a lot of stuff and when you do that it's it's you know i look at it like uh you're going to chop a tree down every day you you hit a little bit and it's eventually going to come down like it mm. might take years but if you go out there one axe a day but if you keep doing it you'll get better and better and better and eventually that tree is going to fall down and there's no stopping you at that point that's a good analogy i gotta use that <laughs> <laughs> i like that a lot I got a bunch of those. um so we were talking a couple weeks ago uh kind of off the radar about how filmmakers should, how you think filmmakers should work with composers and vice versa. And you got, said a lot of great stuff that I wish I could capture. I want to try to get that lightning in a bottle right again. Yeah. Um, so what would you suggest? What are some strategies? I mean, I, I do think, and this, again, I won't, I won't claim this. I wish I could steal this, but it was something that I, I feel good because I, I kind of stumbled upon this through just natural process. But just Michael Giacchino had said, mm -hmm. people asked him what, is good advice for film composers and he said you can either write music or you can't which is kind of what i was saying like if you walk around with this, this compulsion in your head you can either do that or you can't i didn't learn to me what made what moved me musically it just kind of was been programmed in my dna and i've gotten better at channeling it and making it come at will when the clock is mm. ticking you know what i mean but it's either there or you're not um the other side though is learn how to make a movie learn how to be a storyteller because I mean, even, I was, it was funny that he said that because a few months later I was looking at, I think it was Brian Tyler on Instagram who said the same thing. He was mm -hmm. like, go make a movie because when you do that, you learn how insane it is and the, and the most humbling thing happens. This, this thing that we sit here as, as songwriters or composers or you know, musicians or anything you do, we know how long it takes to make this cue, right? However, however you know, from two tracks to thousands, you know how long it takes to do this and then the best and worst thing in the world happens when you get done. You give that to an editor. <laughs> an editor goes, oh, thanks, man. And they drop it in whatever program they're using and they turn it down. Mm -hmm. That's all that happens. And you go, that my was, baby. That was, that was a <laughs> month of work right there. And you're yeah. just, that's how loud it's going to be. You know, you're sure you want to turn on more? And it's, but there is a humility that, that starts to grow inside. Because music, because music can sit as its own, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you go watch a movie and you see all the credits and there's, visual effects guys and there's costume guys there's a million different levels of things caterers truck drivers and but very few of those um art forms exist in and of them in and of themselves as its own thing but music can sit right up here and sometimes music mm. the score is bigger than the film i just saw star wars live and i don't know i don't i don't I'm not, i wouldn't say that necessarily that the score is bigger than the film but the score is better than the film to me like mm. i saw it live and i'm going this movie is just as a movie is fine, but the music is insane. Mm. It's so good, and it carries so many parts where, you know, a guy just staring at the sun, right? Which is mm -hmm. the most, like, I mean, why would you even shoot that? You know, it's just like he's staring at the sun, but then this music comes underneath and tells you everything that he's feeling, and you go, wow, I feel... Yeah. I, I look off into the distance sometimes. Yeah, I do the same thing, you know? Yeah, but, I saw you post on, on Instagram about that. Yeah. It's, I think it's, you said uh, this is the greatest moment in... Cinema history, or whatever yeah. You one, one of my one of my little film scoring class we did. I I talked about that because 
the whole the whole kind of class we, we were we were discussing how great cues work and I was saying don't sweat it though because sometimes you have to trust the director where they just they've lived with this longer than you have so mm. that's that cue I don't know if you know this is the binary sunset is what they call it was not the original cue there and the original cue is on YouTube you can go look it up I'll send you a link to it but the original cue oh, wow. that John Williams wrote is on there and it's fine but it is it is scoring a different emotion than George won and George wow. goes I want this theme back there and so it was George's request to go hey this music you have written for some other thing I want to put it here and that again hmm. and it's so ironic because I think that's one of the best scored things in in, in, in human history here or film history and it wasn't even John Williams idea who's like the greatest and it wasn't even that's his idea. incredible wow yeah and for all the listeners uh, we're gonna put that in the show notes in the, or the YouTube description make sure you check that and we'll yeah. watch that it's like all it's like it's like yeah. binary Sun alter or something like that but it was <laughs> but it's the primary one it was the one he wrote yeah. for it and just didn't work <laughs> that's actually a perfect segue um, yeah. that I've actually heard stories of that happening so many times, yeah. um, all the way from Star Trek to the Alien series to uh, some of the most iconic films in history, where they would either hire one composer and say that this is the wrong style, go to somebody else, or worse, they have a composer write, I think it was Goldsmith, uh, Jerry Goldsmith, who wrote oh, the yeah. entire... For Alien? Um, I think it was Alien. Didn't yeah. he score the entire movie and they scrapped it? Yeah, and he started over and then they Last used second, some other stuff. Yeah, and they just happens. used stock music. They used uh, the Blue Danube. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, orchestral classical music. I think that's just mind-blowing. Yeah. <laughs> As a composer, I've never been fired from a project yeah. and then replaced with something worse. Or uh, not worse. But It'll you know happen. I mean? it, so Zimmer you know said, what I mean? if you're not getting replaced, you haven't done it yet because you will. It's yeah, just, it just happens so, to everybody. And again, but it's because I said that uh, you have to trust that as much time as you've spent on this, Again, you're just one piece of this gigantic puzzle. So to you, it's like this music is the end-all be-all, but the director or the producer at the top is going, yeah, but I have lived. I wrote this story and I know exactly. I know you might think it might need this, but I know exactly what emotion needs to convey. And it could be your piece of music is amazing, but whatever emotion that it's invoking in them, it's not the mm. feeling that they want. And so they're going to find something else to do it. But yeah, it happens, happens to everyone. Just okay, a here's a little a side question. This is not. This is off the cuff. Okay, sure. so get ready. Uh, temp music. We talk yeah. a lot about this in the film music industry, but I want to hear your opinion on it as a filmmaker and a composer. Yeah. Um, what do you do with that? Because obviously you're the one that's writing the music for your own movies. So in a sense, you don't have to go. You skip an entire process of trying to explain what you want through the use of temp music. But I'm sure that you still see things. Yeah. And you still get hired out mm -hmm. to write for other people's films sometimes or TV shows, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, what is your opinion on that? I mean, it's a double-edged sword. Um, you know, I, I think of the term as a songwriter. They call it demoitis when you like you pitch a song. It's like you and the acoustic guitar, but there's a there's a, a rawness to it. And then they're like, "Well, this is what I really want." And no matter what you do to it, hmm. they're never going to like more than what you gave them basically and the same thing with tip music they could get so stuck into it and they just this is what they want however uh on the other side is i love it sometimes because sometimes filmmakers or producers or whoever are just not very articulate when it comes to music and mm -hmm. so there's a great there's another great phrase that's um talking about music is like dancing about architecture have you ever heard that <laughs> no but it is it's like, like it's like using an art form to huh. describe another art form doesn't even really make sense and so and to me, to me, getting your vocabulary right with your filmmaker is, to me, the first step. Because I can say, hey, write me something magical. And magical to you could mean Harry Potter. You know what I mean? But magical to me could mean, I don't know, I, I was, first lesson I don't know what Brandon was like, he would always say magical. Magical to him meant the green, um, well, not what's it, what's it called? Um, it's from Revolutionary Road, the main cue. I can't think of the name of it. Um, I'm not The Road to Chicago. That's one of okay. my favorite Thomas Newman scores. But Brandon loved it. He's like, this is magical to me. I'm like, magic to me is like, you know, <laughs> Is this, you Disney. know, Chalesi? Yeah, yeah, it's this yeah, thing. Yeah. And it just, but that was his language. And that's it. So mm. until I figured that out, but that was one of my first lessons because I would just write, write. And I'm like, what do you mean by magic? And then he sent me that. And I went, oh, your magic is my dark mysterious. Mm. So I'm going to write my dark mysterious. And now all of a sudden it's your magical. And it's a weird, again, it's like a Rosetta Stone to whoever you're wow. working with finding that out. Because that, that, and that lesson has carried me all over the place and especially when someone will say hey I'm interested especially like if a show starts and go, we're thinking this kind of stuff and and I'm going okay it's awesome send me something you know don't get too tied into it but send me something like you're talking about because I can decipher sometimes when they send me a piece of music if they're liking 
you know, the mode that they're using or if it's the instrumentation or the tempo, there's something that when I hear it and they go, I just love how, how when, you know, when these drums hit and it's just moving so quickly, you go, okay, I think you like the tempo and the percussion. I'm just mm -hmm. going to rip the tempo and percussion out of this and ditch, you know, I'll go from major to minor or, you know, I'll switch it all up like that, but take those elements and go, okay, I can make a quick tempo and percussion work for this thing. And they'll, it's a quicker way to get what they're hearing in their head, you know? That's brilliant. That uh, I completely sense. agree. That, that anytime you can get adjectives out of a filmmaker yeah. or same thing is for video games and, and TV anytime you can get the person in charge to use adjectives to describe um, and if it's the first project I agree with you that if you can get some sort of demo music it's yeah. going to attach that vocabulary and it helps you well it helps uh, you know because they don't know music terms they don't know major, yeah. minor, uh, mixolydian they don't understand these things and, or rhythm or tempo something. they don't know anything you know what I mean I've had that before it's <laughs> like I don't know I couldn't tell you what music term I just it's yes or no and I'm like those are the exhausting <laughs> jobs you're like well yeah. and that's why I'm like please send me some kind of music mm -hmm. because I don't even know what you're even talking about here and, and wow. I, that is too you know when you I don't know if you experience this, but when you're writing music all the time, it's hard to find new music because when you stop list, when you stop making it, sometimes when I drive home, I'm like, well, it's time for an audiobook, you know, because you <laughs> just want to not listen to something for a while, you yeah. reset your brain. So they'll send me stuff. I just did, I just did a project, um, and it was a sci-fi thing, and they wanted, they kept saying sci-fi, and I'm like, I don't, there's, that's so gigantic, you know, mm. I don't know what you're talking about, but he sent me some scores I'd never even heard of, and I, one of them, like, this is one of my favorite things, I was so excited about listening <laughs> to that, I'd never really listened to it before, and so, it was a great way of finding new music, and it was like, okay, that's what you mean by sci-fi, okay, so we're not doing the 50s theremin, yeah, okay, yeah. and we're not doing Star Wars, so where, where am I falling in this line here, you know? Wow. Because they'll say that, yeah, here's a genre, do action adventure. Like, well, that is a huge swath of films and music. Uh, let's narrow that down a bit. Because for me, I, I want, I need way less colors. I mean, this mm -hmm. is me personally. I don't want, I don't want all the colors of the rainbow. I need like six. Because if I look at all the colors of the rainbow, I'm going to go, I don't, it's overwhelming to me. And as an, as an artist or a writer, I go, okay, let me, I want to walk down a narrower hallway. If it's too big you know you've seen movies like that or her music that's just kind of all over the map and I'm and this is just my my personal take though I just love stuff that feels like there was one door for this film that's it and so cast wardrobe music sound everything probably the catering on set honestly some of these guys went through this one door and there was no other way through to the MOV file except for this one small channel um, films like to me like The Revenant is one of those like mm. everything about that film is just is huge. The music is spacey. The vistas are spacey. Even when they go to a close up, it's on a 14 millimeter. It's on the widest lens you can get. Mm -hmm. That's their close up lens. Is the widest lens because it's meant to be overwhelming you with the vastness of the space. And so I look at that and go, that's wow. kind of where I want to go. To. I love films that that kind of have that channel. You know, or we talk about Psycho, the black yeah. and white score. Everything went down this. All right, we're going to go down this specific road. Even so much of someone like Bernard Herrmann going, okay. Is a master. I'm going to limit myself to just strings, and that was just strings, a mm. small section of strings. I mean, it's not a quartet. He he branched out, but it was like I'm not going to do a full string section. I think he did like, I don't remember, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a full orchestra just devoid of everyone small. else. It was a smaller ensemble. And so, no, this is this is the road we're walking down. This is the only thing that's going to make it in the film. And to me, those are the films that speak to me for sure. Wow. Now we also had a fun little rant uh, talking last time about. Star Wars, the most recent <laughs> film. What was your opinion on that score? My opinion on the score. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I laughed when you, when I, you mentioned I, it. I mean, I'm the last person that's ever gonna ever going to critique John Williams. I think none of us would be. I know personally, I wouldn't be sitting here without John Williams. So I'm not For sure gonna talk any smack about him. <laughs> However, um, there are some people. My favorite kind of music to listen to is the stuff that I would never, ever in a million years get to. Hmm. So I don't know if you feel this way, but. I'll listen to something sometimes go and go, I don't really like that. And the other time is, oh, I love that. Um, I wish I had time. I wish, <laughs> I, I, wish I would have done that because I think that's doable for me. Like mm. I've heard some songs over the years. I'm like, boy, that song, I live that. I, could, I should have written this song. Why didn't I write this song? I'm so <laughs> mad at myself. You know what I mean? Or I'll hear a piece of music and go, yeah. I could do that. But every once in a while, this is my favorite. This is why I love Thomas Newman so much because I listen to his scores. I go, uh, <laughs> like I mean, I, everything about him is like I don't know how he got this instrumentation. I don't know what even this yeah. is called, much less how to write masterfully for it. That's Alexander Splat for me. Yeah, you're just like no clue. Yeah, on my on my best day with yeah. everything in my corner going my way, the sun <laughs> shining, wind at my back, I'm never gonna get that music. Yeah. So 
Um, John Williams, of course, can do that in space, but there was a moment in in um, Last Jedi where I'm sitting there, and it's right after Luke comes back. Spoiler alert! He comes back and meets <laughs> Leia right there together, and they kind of have their last moment where the theme comes back. Yeah, and yeah, God's yeah. good theme. Where is that theme? The rest, you know. And then he walks away, and it's like he does some rhythm thing that I go, it's it's not difficult. I just go, I never would have thought of that. Like just mm. never in a, in a million years would have done that. And as long as I can find some pieces of those in music, I go, man, that's just, for me, that's all I want. Because yeah. most of it's like, you know, John Williams is, his D music is everyone else's A. You know what I mean? It's so like him yeah. just swirling around yeah. is still like, well, I couldn't do that. You know? <laughs> but as far as to be, to critique it, yeah, you know, it's definitely, again, I don't want to critique John because he's 85. I don't think the it's the music, the But yeah, I don't think it's music. It's I not think the it's, music's fault. It's not his fault. Yeah, I feel but like something it's happened. Thing, yeah. So what do you think happened in the relationship with, yeah, that was, that was, I mean, again, I don't know, I'm not involved, but what I read was that they hired a uh, Cracker Jack music editor, and he took all of the prior films, and he edited um, the film with the with the temp music, to the, to the, said, this is what I so want. He with John Williams' Tim, With Star his own Wars work music. from Star Wars, it's uh, not like he pulled, like, from Harry Potter or something, yeah. it was, like, everything, and he's like, this is, this is the movie, and so then. That is the worst Yeah, it's a setup. Kid, well, especially for him, too, I mean, John Williams is, he's 85, and He's worked one way his whole life. You know what I mean? Um, and although I, I watched the post recently and he had a loop in there, I was like, <laughs> he didn't put that loop in there. You know what I mean? But I'm like, listen, yeah. like he had some kid go, hey, yeah, can yeah, I have yeah. some, rip-? Yeah. you know, he probably said, can I have this Austin and blah, blah, And it was like, <laughs> you mean a loop? Yeah, sure. You know, I'll drag it into the window. But, um, but yeah, I, I feel like, I feel like some of those filmmakers um, like Ryan or um, JJ are more used to working with fully fully mapped out demos and stuff like that and they can just get them in there and just wallpaper the film with them and John's mm-hmm. going well I guess there's not really much room for me to breathe or do what I want to do you know wow that's how I feel about it. Uh, don't uh, send me letters <laughs> send them to Steve <laughs> that's fine that's fine so what advice do you have for new film composers we talked a little bit about the filmmaking side but yeah. as a filmmaker let's say for example you need to hire out your next film to a young composer let's say they're 20 something fresh out of college, or maybe even not college. A lot of people are not going to college now for film. Yeah. Um, they've had a, they've had some success. They've written for some short films, et cetera. But what is like, what are the top two or three qualities that you are looking for in um, a brand new composer for you? I mean, for that me? Would make, that would, you would choose this person over 10 other applicants. I mean, I'd honestly, I'll go back to, if you if you, you need the right music, you can't. So I'll, if, if it gets to me, I'll know that real quick. You know, Mm. if it's even gotten to the door, like there's a threshold of getting great at your craft that just has to pass that. You know, I lead a multitude of artists when I go produce a film. Sometimes there's, there's a hundred people I have Mm. to lead as a producer and artists, they're all the same. They're all insecure and a lot of them are messes and they're late and they're irresponsible. And the ones that tend to rise to the top are, have overcome that. It's not that they're not that way because Mm. I, can do be 100% all those things, but they know that about themselves and they overcome that. There's a million books on, I mean, there's one, the one I can think of is John Maxwell wrote a book called Talent is Never Enough. Hmm. And in it, I think he quoted Stephen, Stephen King saying, talent is as common as table salt. <laughs> which is like, which is like, you know, you have a great idea, wonderful. Can you execute this and do this by five o'clock tomorrow? Because mm. if you can't, I'm not going to call you ever again. And so there's a there's a couple of guys that I have worked with, even not necessarily writing, um, like hiring, but writing for me. Like I've done a TV show where I've had to have too many cues, and I go, well, I'm going to sub out some of this stuff to a buddy of mine who's just great because I know he'll do it, and I don't have to worry about it. If I mm. say, hey man, this is Davis Harwell, plug Davis is amazing. If I say do this by Tomorrow, if if it's if it's Tuesday at five o'clock and say I need this tomorrow by nine a.m., he'll do it. He'll go, mm. I'm in, and he'll make it work. And that's to me is half the battle. I mean, gosh, it's seventy percent of the battle. Hey, you want to meet me for coffee? You know, be on time. Don't be late. Be on time. Be early. Waiting for me. Go. Hey, I ordered you a coffee. Like yeah. so many basic human interactions that artists feel like they get to skip over because, oh, I'm talented. And mm. some of it's from ignorance of like, oh, I'm just a mess and a lovable mess. You know, we've all met those. You're like, you're so brilliant, but you can't yeah. tie your shoelaces together. And some of them are more arrogant and they think they're above some things. But there's a humility and a, again, I, I the term we use at White is can you tie your shoes? It's like, I mean, it's a simple <laughs> thing, but like some of them can't keep calendars. They can't keep commitments. You know, they'll show up for this thing later. I was, I was on time for this, correct? Mm. Just so we're clear? Okay, just make sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that, but honestly, that's it. And past that, I'll know if you can write music in two seconds, and I'll know if you can. 
because sometimes it doesn't even need to be this amazing cue. You know, there's some so many times what need what works is very simple and easy underneath this thing. It's got to be, you know, we're not we're not all getting the binary sun with someone <laughs> looking longingly off in the sunset yeah. that says, okay, you've got 20 seconds. Grab make, whatever you want. Make me cry, you know, <laughs> take me there as opposed to like, all right, here's someone talking for, for 10 minutes. I need you to not get in the way, you know, <laughs> and like, but it's a gig yeah. and sometimes, you know, you do enough of those and you'll get some great ones. I've done that. I mean, I just did that where I did so many just um, what most people would look at as like really small, insignificant kind of basic pieces of music. And then, but I was, I killed it. I was on time. I did. Mm. They were always like, how do you do this so fast? I'm like, well, I've worked hard and I've got a template and I've just, I mean, it's years of experience. And then it came to a huge project and they were like, hey, you want to submit something for this? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> did that, got picked. And it was a, it's a big old project. And, but it stemmed from all kinds of little things over the years mm. from that way. But just, okay. So may, perhaps this is the project you're, you're referring to. Um, I know you recently posted on social media that uh, you recently had the opportunity to score main titles yeah. of an AMC show, major yeah. network TV show. First of all, how did you land this job if yeah. you were at liberty to discuss yeah. that? And how was that experience? Give us anything you got, sure. either from the filmmaking side, but in this case, you are a yeah. composer. So. Well, it stemmed from both. I mean, Brandon and I at Whitestone um, wrote a feature film about the lost colony of Roanoke, and when we were trying to make it, we had also written kind of like a nonfiction component because it's just history and we're nerds about it. And <laughs> so we eventually, through a long series of events, sold that to the History Channel and they made that show and we did that. We got to kind of make our pieces of it and I had done some music. They partnered us up with a company that was more familiar with Unscripted and they turned it from our narrative concept into like a one of the, a tip, what I would con consider a typical History Channel, you know, reality TV. But we got to put in a lot of our cool kind of history stuff in there. But I part of the deal was, well, I'm going to do music for this because most of the time they just have a library they pull from. They don't really mm -hmm. care. And some guy has no idea that his music's in there and he gets a check from Ask Capper being mine and goes, oh, I made a History Channel show this week. <laughs> I'm, I hope you have some of those. It's mailbox yeah. money, right? Those are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But through that, I'd done that film and they were fans of what I had done. Again, did a lot of music for not a lot of money and not a lot of time. That was that started like I had to do, <laughs> each cue is around two minutes long and I would say I had to do 40 in a month, like oh, an insane yeah. amount. Of, yeah, it's a lot of music. And I was doing at least one or two a day. Now is this then, live musicians or is this? No, this is okay. just as Studio. quickly as I can plug. But it is, it was orchestral stuff. So I mean, it was like I had to write for strings and perk mm -hmm. and it had to have, again, it has to sound good too. Like I don't care how good of an orchestrator you are. If you're doing it with stock instruments, I'm not gonna put it in there. It could be amazing. Oh, that sounds fake. Nope. Yeah. And so being a good, that's what they say about Hans Zimmer is how, what a great record producer he is. And he is, he's amazing. And that's why he I think he gets such a great you know I look to him up I look up to him a lot because he is wonderful being a record producer you know okay I'm gonna make a pad I'm not gonna use a pad I'm gonna and I did a lot I'm gonna make this pad out of mm. a banjo with reverb and delay and then the thing and like it, it turns into this wall of something that just came from me hitting a banjo with a paintbrush like <laughs> there's those creative elements um but doing that and building a palette and giving them stingers and all kinds of cues and all this stuff over a lot of time. And they said, okay, yeah, I guess you're pretty good at this. That's amazing you could do it this fast. And they would just throw me other stuff. That job turned into a, a super fruitful relationship where I ended up doing a big documentary then for called 15 September's Later, which was uh, a document they did on the 15th anniversary of, of September 11th. And that had, mm -hmm. had everyone in it, man. I'm like, again, it's, I like these guys because they just go, hey, would you send something they didn't really tell me what it's for and then I get back like hey would you would you we're going to use your music for the opening of the show the show but I'm like okay cool would you mind editing something I'm like yeah send me the thing and I open it and it's like you know the president's on there and I'm like <laughs> oh and then like you know everyone from that time it was George W. Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and Giuliani and then it had like all the Matthew Broderick people living in, in, in New York yeah. at the time and I'm like Oh, this is a this is a lot of money spent on this one. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll do my job. But a bunch of those I've done kind of over the years, and it turned into there's hey, we got this sh another show coming, and I, and but again, several other shows like that. Lots of music, not a lot of time. They call yeah. me, and I knock it out. And this turned into hey, opening titles for this thing, <laughs> science fiction. Could you write something? Um, sure thing. So I wrote something. It was like a thirty second thing, and then they got sent me back. Hey. Um, you know, we don't know if we're going to use this or not. You, we're, we're calling a lot of people. They're very coy about it. I'm like, all right, whatever. You know, it was cool. They didn't tell me what it was, and they yeah. said, we'll send you back the motion graphics and see if you can kind of make it hit better. Well, either I won the job immediately, or they were just yanking my chain because <laughs> I get the music cue back, and it's um, it's 
the motion graphics would like sunk to the music. I'm like, you liars! Like, this thing is completely <laughs> sunk to it. This is exactly what's happening. Um, so wow. then I then began the long process of kind of fine tuning and stuff like that. But then when it lands, it's you know James Cameron presents the story of science fiction. I was like. Wait, what? Wait, what name was that again? Yeah, I know. Exactly. You mean from like, you know, like James Avatar, Cameron, James Avatar, Cameron. James Cameron. <laughs> and so then they slowly started to tell me about it. And then that process was, I mean, I did, you know, contractually, I was due for like three edits, re, you know, mm-hmm. tweaks. Mm-hmm. I did probably a dozen at least. Sure. Over 30 seconds of music, I'm like, okay. I don't really know what else to add or take away from this. It was a, it was a very difficult process and AMC I think one time said something and I was like I don't know if I agree with this I'm like wait you know I did listen to a podcast where they interviewed Vince Gilligan for who created Breaking Bad mm-hmm. and he's always he said AMC has great notes I'm like all right let me just be humble and take AMC's <laughs> notes and I would tweak it and eventually going up and then it turned into like I'm just there was a point in time there where I was like I'm just tired of working this I don't have anything else to do and they mm-hmm. said hey will you do one more tweak and also invent some kind of you know, sound design, sass, music cue that will go into each episode. There's like six episodes about different mm-hmm. elements of sci-fi. And I was just like, I was this close to just being a baby. I'm like, oh my gosh, guys, uh, this is the last <laughs> one, you know. But they sent it to me, and it's the first time I'd seen the show. And it mm-hmm. opens up with Zoe Saldana, and it goes to Steven Spielberg. And I'm just like, I'm at my office. I'm at my office like this is like, you know, the office, right? I'm yeah, by myself yeah. working on this thing, and it pops up, and Spielberg's face pops up. And I hit space bar. And I mugged the invisible camera. I did. I was just like, <laughs> I was like, okay, <clears throat> I'll do as many edits as you'd like. A thousand, <laughs> no problem. And so then I quit being a baby about it um, yeah. and did it that way. But yeah, it, awesome. they just, I, I, you know, I forgot that they were going to, because they, you know, you do these things and you have they don't call me and tell me when it's going to air. And so that someone had said, I told someone about it. Because again, and the other thing is too, man, you don't know if you got it until it airs. That's that's the rule. I've talked to way too many actors over the years, like, I've got this film, and then they cut them out. You don't know it, so I'm like, I haven't told anybody about it. I didn't tell you about it, because I'm yeah, like, right. I don't want to say anything you know? about it, and then it doesn't air, but... That's for a commercial for it. Which is another thing, too. I was more excited about that. They never, you know, every time advertisers, they pick their own music, but they pick the music from the opening titles for the commercial, too. And I was wow. like, okay. So it was neat to see that, and that was... I, yeah, I put that on Instagram because I was like, all right, it's official now. I can at least yeah. share it with people because... Now, is that something, just out of curiosity, is that, do you think that piece would go to ASCAP BMI because it's in the commercial? Um, just, It's the commercial. Here's the thing. I don't, I'm terrible at this. I'm terrible at the business side of it. does AMC own it, basically, because... It's, I mean, well, you know, when you have a piece of music, you have two copyrights. You have the circle C, which is the notes or the lyrics if you have a song, and then the circle P, which is the sound recording copyright. And when they hire you to do it, they're going to own the Circle P, which is, hey, you make us a sound mm-hmm. recording, and it's ours. And the other side of it is the of the Circle C that's split into two things, which is the writer's share and the publisher's share. If you're self-published, which I am for most of the stuff because I'm not going to go start some other company, I own, it's called 200%, which mm-hmm. is 200% of the copyright. But with this, it's like you only get, they can't take away your writer's share by law. It's just it's how the law works. So I get that, which is essentially for every dollar that comes in, I get... I think at 50, I get 25 cents basically for it. So it's not not bad. And again, that's great. I'll take it. I would have paid, TV, I would have you know. paid to do that gig. Yeah. So I told sure. them they didn't, they didn't yeah, pay yeah. me very much because they didn't tell me what it was. I probably would have asked more money if, if they if I found out that it was <laughs> that it, that it had that budget for Steven Spielberg and clips for you know Back yeah. to the Future on it. You know. But, but that was another weird thing too, man. So I'm doing these titles and it's like any other show. There's a million pieces of music needed and half of them for a library. And they're like, hey, we're having trouble you know, finding p- music that will work under Jurassic Park because it's so big. <laughs> Can you write something? Oh, no. This, But this is the note I get. Can you write something? Well, first off, I was like, are you familiar with the music from Jurassic Park? Have you heard of this guy and, named John Williams? Yeah, and they send me a YouTube link. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, guys, I'm familiar. Um, I'm not talking smack. I love these guys. But it, was, but it was like, yeah, I know what Jurassic they Park is. They have to cover is. their bases. Exactly. Come on. So I get it. And they're like, hey, Steven Spielberg is going to talk about Jurassic Park. Can you write something that? I don't even know what you do. What do you do to that? Why? Well, that's what. So not only that, though, but it can't be a sound alike because those are cheesy. So it can't be like the same instrumentation, yeah. and all it can't be near as busy because it needs to be under people talking. It's got to mm. be quiet. Like so, all these conditions. But Jurassic Park, go. And I'm like, I don't know. And so I just wrote a string bed of simple changes, like getting rid of the melody of like. Mm. 
<laughs> but I changed. I made. But I did that instrumentation of just strings, the lower register, and just kind of did changes, and it worked what they want. And then they called me again. Mm. Hey, we have um, Robert Zemeckis talking about Back to the Future. Could you do the same thing with another you know, another yeah. link to Back to the Future? I'm like, yep, yeah, no, that one too. You don't understand. I, I have the DeLorean on my S my desk right now. That's so funny. Um, but the same thing. So I'm like, okay. So I wrote a loop in like Lydian with a piano. Mm. Um, I think I used those changes of like. You know, uh, flat seven four five just because it was in that universe, yeah, and they're, yeah, gonna, yeah. they're not going to yell at me for doing a chord progression. So, but same thing, and just like in the background. But oh, and also, sorry, I didn't mention this. Oh, and all that, and make it sound like your opening title, which has nothing to do with this stuff. And I'm like, okay, here's my grab bag. It's like, well, here's your vocabulary. Exactly. Yeah, it's like make a meal out of you know? hot dogs and caviar and <laughs> spaghettios and uh, some frosted flakes, and you're like, all right. But that's what it feels like, yeah. though. You're like, none of these ever overlap. So, you know, all right, I'll take the sugar off the frosted flakes, and like it's one of those things. But oh, you do, man. you turn into that. So the the Back to the Future thing, I just use some of this. I made a template from, for, like, I derived a template from the opening titles, found my synth sounds, and used. Mm all those same sounds while writing for this kind of vibe. And so, you know, I'll, when this is over, I'll show you the thing because it's weird how it kind of, you'll go, yeah, that makes sense. But it was super strange <laughs> to do for dang sure, yeah. Yeah, and by the way, uh, do we have access to that commercial? Uh, yeah, that the on commercial's YouTube? on my Instagram thing. Um, okay. When the opening, when the show, the show airs April, end of April or something like that, and then I'll I'll send you a link to that because that they'll okay. have it online. So the for cool anyone that wants to watch it now, if they follow you on Instagram at Nicholas Kirk, yeah, uh, they can watch. Yeah, it's recent. just the commercial that has it on yeah. there. But the actual opening titles were done by I can't even the name of the company. Forgive me. They did Westworld. This is like oh, a wow. huge yeah. company in New York, and then Ranky Dink Music from Buford, Georgia. <laughs> it's very very odd how that uh, ended up. But I was laughing. I was like, yeah, I'll take it any day of the week because <laughs> they look stupid legit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I was like, oh, I'm that's good. awesome. Well, uh, I know we're wrapping up here. We got we got a few minutes left. I do have a bonus question for you. Bonus for the bonus question is a okay. pre bonus question. Do you have any final advice? For for uh, new composers or new filmmakers looking to get into the industry, a lot of people complain that it's too hard or it's yeah. it's too uh, oversaturated. Too many people trying to do it. Um, how would you? What would you recommend that these uh, new filmmakers and composers do to put their unique stamp on it to stand well, out? But that's it, though. Be super authentic to you. No matter how weird you are, be authentic. I mean, the the the, the film that we're getting. An insane amount of traction right now. I can tell you this part: it's a Southern Gothic musical. It is the weirdest <laughs> thing. Uh, my favorite, we, my favorite note. We just got back from uh, somewhere we're, we're pitching it to. He said, "If I had every film in town and I put it on the wall and I had ten thousand darts and threw them all, I would never land on yours." Wow! And that's why I love it because everyone else is everyone's trying to find a way to make money, which sucks because like, you totally have to. You have to sometimes mm -hmm. you have to make the donuts, right? You're gonna, all right, I'm gonna make my bread and butter cues, but. You gotta retain, and that's more for your sanity too, as an as an artist. Mm -hmm. Like, find the thing that you love that, and it will develop eventually. And you start off, and you don't have a style, and you copy everyone else, and eventually you start to get a style, and just do that. Because if you do that, number you know one or two things will happen. You'll find out uh, uh, if you have an audience, mm -hmm. and which you might. Which at that point, you might want to change. You know, you could like something so weird that no one's ever gonna <laughs> like it. You know, which is possible, or. I guarantee you, though, the other side, which is you'll get a mega niche. You'll find plenty of people mm. like stuff. Because what's hilarious to me is that, like, video games to me, I don't know. I, I know those things from growing up, but it's not something I remotely do. So I hear you talk video games, I go, clueless. Like, I've seen you play. I'm like, oh, I remember that. I, would, I wouldn't know the first <laughs> thing. I would approach doing a video game like anything else. I, I, can, I know I can write music. Stories, man. Yeah, but the, but the fundamentals of game, I'm like, I don't have a clue how this stuff works. But... Everyone has their thing that is authentic and unique to them, and no matter how bad it hurts, no matter how broke you get, keep going down that road because you will find someone out there, a director or producer goes, you hear this weird thing? I like this guy. The guy who invented the bomb. It wasn't Zimmer. Hmm. It was some guy who had written trailer music, and they put it on Inception. Now, it was weird. It coincided that Zimmer had something very similar to that, but just the one note... Blah, they're using everything it was just a yeah. guy and it was something he wanted to do he had an idea what if cool. I made this low brass and put it in a river I mean had all this, the components of it and it got used everywhere and got all kinds of work after that but be hmm. be yourself be authentic be, be true find the thing that makes you you and and run after that and and screw everyone else <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fantastic advice yeah. 
All right, bonus question. Bonus. What? I think I already know the answer, but I want I want to hear it from your lips. What is your favorite movie based on both the film quality and the music score? So they're not separate from one another. And you've yeah. already kind of mentioned that you're they kind of coincide already. Yeah. But if you had to pick one movie, Desert Island movie, the only one you ever get to watch again. I mean, my I what mean, these happen to coincide. But yeah, my favorite film of all time is Raiders of the Lost Ark. That just that movie to me is such a masterpiece of a film. It is. Um, I love that film. But I mean, I've got a. There's a couple of ET is another one that's just it's so funny. I saw Star Wars recently, and the beauty yeah. of seeing these things live is you can separate them. And I go, mm. Star Wars as a movie without John Williams is like as far as how movies the acting is kind of you know it's just it's not the great it's not ET it's not even no. close to ET so I agree. like. So, so I would say um, Raiders is my favorite, but you can go on a list with E.T., um, The Godfather. There's a couple of these films that just like, to me, are just perfect movies no matter what. Um, hmm. I'm going to be wooden now when I think about it. Shawshank Redemption is up there because I love that score too. Shawshank, man, it that's fits. good. That's Thomas Newman. That's, yeah, Thomas Newman. That's probably, killing it. for me, one of his best. Yeah. I mean, this isn't, I don't think the best movie, but to me, like to me, Finding Nemo, I think it's such a perfect story, hmm. perfectly told, and that music is just... When also that, Thomas Newman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When the Nemo, when the when the theme hits, and it's just that one egg, and he does his Newman thing, which is I'm going to write a melody that's like the anti melody that is not singable, but somehow seems completely singable, and it's not <laughs> stepwise, but it's close enough, and and it just you know it hits, and you go, wow, I feel everything right now from that. Um, hmm. You know, I said I gave you a lot of them, but but <laughs> Raiders to me is like there's nothing better than that than the pacing and the genius of that film, and then having a hero's thing that is so just. You can't you can't separate those two. I love themes mm-hmm. where you cannot separate them from the characters. You cannot separate Darth Vader's theme from Darth Vader. That's so it's true. like that's this thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You go, well, that's that to <laughs> me is the evidence of a of a wonderful theme. Is it is so iconic to that character? To me, um, you know, the Raiders march. That theme is just as iconic as the hat and the bullwhip. You know, because if I tell a kid what's Indiana Jones, even one of my kids will either go get a bullwhip, you know, from the closet, you know, or they'll hum Raiders. It's just, it's mm. in their DNA. And to me, that is, if you can find a way to write a theme on that, we could, I have like, I have pages of notes on, on themes because <laughs> I try to pull them out and backwards write themes. We can do another podcast just on themes yeah. because there's so many of them out there and few of them are just like, yep, that character is that theme and that's it. That's that, that's all there is to it. Nothing gets, nothing gets past that. It's perfect, you know? Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Nick, thank you so much for being here. Dude, thank I know you for we gotta, inviting me. Yeah, we got to be uh, cognizant of time, but uh, thank you. Um, I know that there's a ton of great information here that we're going to want to rewatch this a bunch of times. Um, but again, you can follow Nick on Instagram at Nicholas Kirk and WhitestoneMP.com. You can look at uh, all the films that Whitestone's been putting out yep. and what, what's on the horizon for them right now. Again, we're, we're, we're trying to get this feature film off the ground right now, the Southern, the Southern Gothic musical that's going to be uh, very strange and cool. Though. That sounds awesome. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be looking out for that. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you so much, Nick. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Everyone thinks the Beatles sang through a U-47, which is like the iconic mic, the Frank Sinatra, everyone, everyone sings to that microphone, but there was a U-48, <laughs> which had a different polar pattern, it was figure eight, so they would stare at each other and sing harmonies, all those Beatles recorded uh-huh. just them singing next to each other, because the, uh, what you call it, the 47 is just cardioid or omni, and mm. so the uh, figure eight, they do that and the band would sit here so they would be off axis, you know what I mean? That's the amazing. Band, the band, the Beatles, John and Paul would stare at each other and create amazing music. <laughs> That's how it goes. It, it does, does, man. Yeah. I love the Beatles. That's, That's awesome. Dude, me too.